Amen. Hello, everyone. My name is Victoria. Most of you know me by my voice via Zoom. And we're just putting a person to that voice. <laughs> so um, today I'm going to be talking about um, my topic is a living parable. And um, I want to start out by asking a question that Brother Victor touched on when he presented Wednesday night. He asked, what is parable teaching? Can anyone answer that question? Just give me a, a simple um, definition of what parable teaching is. Oops. Oh, and feel free to ask questions, um, make comments, do this presentation, just like a normal Bible study. Um, I like the engagement. It helps me to learn more, too, as well. So, what is parable teaching? The test. Okay. Anyone else? So, the definition, um, I'm going to paraphrase the definition that El Departmenter gives for parable teaching. And I word it as the method sorry for my handwriting. <laughs> the method by which one uses the natural the natural things to explain what? Spiritual. spiritual. Good. The spiritual. Amen. Is that what that is? Parable teaching is the method by which one uses the natural things to explain the spiritual. And that is the purpose of the study today, is to understand parable teaching, the natural and the spiritual. Okay, so how many of you have ever heard the phrase, well, most of you who have been partaking in my studies, you should know, but if you forgot, um, it's okay. So a thought, um, produces a word, right? So before you speak, you have a thought, right? So a thought becomes a word, and your word becomes what? Action. Action, good. Or behavior, right? Oops. Action or behavior. And your action becomes what? Habit, right? So we can go like this. And your habit becomes what? Good, character. And your character becomes what? Oh, sorry. So we have thought, word, action, habit, character. And what does your character determine? Your destiny, good. This phrase has become has helped me to understand parables like no other because this has helped me to understand why it's important for us to even understand parables. So behind every word is a what? Good, a thought. And so we have come to understand that behind every form of communication, there is a thought. The one communicating in however form he or she chooses, is sharing their mind in the hopes that the one listening correctly understands him or her and becomes more familiar with, what, with, the, way, um, with the way he or she operates and views things from his or her perspective. So in understanding this point, we can see that through that, that um, sorry, you see that. I'm so sorry. So in understanding this point, we can see that 
through God communicating to us. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so in understanding this point, we can see that through God communicating to us, he is allowing us entrance into his mind in order for us to know and understand him and his ways from his perspective. So when he speaks, what is he doing? Allowing us into his mind because that very word came from his thinking. Before you even speak, you have to think, right? So we are allowed into God's mind through his word. And in order to understand the depths of his thoughts, we use rules and parables. Parables provide us the additional information that we cannot see from the plain form of communication itself. Okay. So another point that I do want to bring up before I go on to the next slide is that your thought, or we can say mind, is what? It's on your notes. It can also be viewed as what? Your, care, your heart, good, your heart. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Your heart, and your heart what? Your character. Good, your character. And your character? Yourself. yourself. And we'll just put himself for God. Right? So when we know God's mind, we know him. Right? We know him. So allowing God, when God opens up his word and we enter into his mind, we come to know him. Right? Or any, or any author. So what is the methodology that God is using to communicate to us and help us to understand him? Anyone? Parables. Yes, parables. Good, you have William Miller's rules. So I wrote too big here. We're just gonna put it here. William Miller, 14 rules of Bible interp interpretation. And what else do you have? The line of progression, right? And what is basically the, uh, the line of progression that's allowing us to do? Or what is that? Yeah. Okay, those are, yes, we can say that. So the line of progression can be understood as a thought, a process of thought, or a thought in progress, right? It's one thought after another. So that's how we can view line upon line. I mean, sorry, not line upon line, but line of progression. Line upon line, how can we view that? How can we understand that in a simple way? Good, yeah, it's the breakdown of a thought or expansion of a thought, right? Remember, we're trying to understand God. We're trying to understand the mind of God so and who he is. And this is the way that he's allowing us entrance into his mind to eventually know him, ultimately know him. So what about, we also have parables, right? So what does parables do? How do, how do they help us to understand the mind of God? They help us to understand the spiritual. Yes, they, you can say that, yeah. They give us insight into his thought. So by a simple, thus saith the Lord, a plain writing of what he has said, there's deeper meaning from what he is actually saying that we can know through parables, right? So parables gives us insight into his thoughts. Can everyone um, see that, understand that? Yes. Okay, so... Using the correct methodology and the rules properly will help us to have the right interpretation of what God is communicating to us. Okay. So, what are some forms of communication? Anyone? Books. Yeah, books. What else? Sorry, essays, yes. What are forms of communication that people talk to us? The people express their mind to us. 
Words, good. Movies, what are something, nature, animals. We can learn, God uses everything. He uses providence, he uses history, dispensations, right? These are all forms of communication in which God talks to us. And what can we do with that information? We can put it on a line, right? We put his word on a line so that we can better understand him, right? So ultimately, what is this? What is this? Communication. Line of communication. Or what did we say? Behind a word is what? A thought. And what is that thought? It's the mind of God. And ultimately, what is the mind? Oops. What is the mind? The heart, the character, himself. So this is Christ, right? And the lines. God is expressing himself through these lines. And this is how we better understand him. Does everybody understand that and get that? All right. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. If I'm going too fast, also please let me know. So we can take any and every form of communication and place it on a line. And we know that through that, God is helping us to understand himself. So every line of communication can be viewed as a parable, right? So what does that look like? OK. This is a parable, right? Yeah. This is a parable, right? Mm -hmm. This whole thing is a parable. What does that look like? Wills within wills. All right. Oops. I want to use different colors to illustrate something. So we know that point one in and of itself is a parable. And that because point one, uh, point two comes after point one, and point one comes before point two. So therefore, they're connected. There couldn't be a point two without a point one. Therefore, the same applies to each period. Um, um, yes, each period is in of itself a parable. The entire line from start to finish is a parable. Does that make sense? Does this look complicated? No, but what if I do this? Does that look crazy? That looks just confusing, right? So what did God say to us? We can learn something from Ezekiel, can't we? About wills within wills, right? Um, Sister White comments, to the prophet, the will within a will, the appearance of, a living, of living creatures connected with them all seemed intricate and unexplainable. But the hand of infinite wisdom is seen among the wills, and perfect order is the result of its work. Every will works in perfect harmony with every other. Right? So in all of this, like, apparently confusion, what keeps it together? Huh? Good job. Awesome. Our theme, right? So that is a blessing, right? That Elder Tess has pointed out something very important, that in every line we need a theme to connect all these thoughts together, right? To help us to understand these wills within wills. 
So therefore, it does not become so complicated, right? Chaos. Yeah. So make sure that as you are placing things on the line, that you're not just putting them anywhere and everywhere on the line, but that you have a theme connecting all your thoughts together. Because that's how we make sense of God's thought, of thoughts, of his thoughts. So let's, let's practice with this. So what better book to turn to than to understand parable teaching than Christ's object lessons, right? <laughs> so we're going to focus in Christ's ob lit, um, object lessons to understand parable teaching. And so when you have this book, right, it's a form of communication, right? We have book, Christ's object lessons. I wrote too big. I have to work on that. <laughs> OK? And so we have chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and chapter four. This is a line of what? Progression. Progression going on and on and on, right? And so um, let me organize my thoughts in my head. OK. Where was I going? Lost my thought. OK, yes, this is the line of progression. So can we cut this line, this per line in particular? No. Not, um, in the line of progression, not every line can be cut. So what can we turn to? What rule can we use? Good job. Who said Miller's rule number one? I know you, Sister Tony, but someone else? Yes, we can use Miller's rule number one. Every word needs to have its proper bearing. Bearing here means proper weight and direction. In other words, what is or are the most important words? All else is viewed as noise. So if we're opening up the book of Christ's Object Lessons to understand parables, what's going to be the most important chapter to us? So that means this, this, this is noise, right? Does that mean that they're not important? No, it just means that this is the most important because this is what we're going to be focusing on, right? This is what we're going to be looking into. So we can take, we're going to go into chapter one, right? And remember behind every word is a thought. And the lines are which helps us to understand the mind of God by his word, right? So we're in that chapter, chapter one of um, Christ's object lessons, right? And so then what do you have? Paragraphs. Paragraphs. You have paragraph one, paragraph two, paragraph three, paragraph four, and on and on and on and on, right? What's gonna become the most important to us? The first, all else becomes noise. noise. Not important to us at this time because we're focusing on the first chapter, the first paragraph. And in that paragraph, right, that first paragraph, what do we have? Sentences, right? The first sentence, sentence one, or we can say uh, first sentence, second sentence, third, third, fourth. Sorry for my handwriting. Right? What becomes the most important to us? The first sentence. All this becomes noise. Interesting how God is allowing us to just zoom in on what he is trying to tell us, right? <laughs> then we have that sentence. The All 
Okay, and what do we have? Words. 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 Now this becomes interesting because Par Elder Parmender wants us to focus on two words. And what is that? Teaching and mission, which is the fourth. Teaching is the fourth word, right? And then the 14th word is mission. So let's just imagine that this is a very long line, okay? <laughs> and it's one to 14, okay? And so all the others become non-important, but these are the most important. All others become noise, but they still have their proper bearing and importance to help us to understand him. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because that's what he um, focused on. Well, when we, we know that when we're studying something like a verse or a paragraph or whatever word we're coming to want, um, studying, we want to know what's the most important word, right? So if we're, yeah, and it is because this is his study, but sure, when you're going into chapter, um, a chapter, you're going to start with the first paragraph, right? You're going to start with the first sentence, and then those words, what are the most important words in that sentence, right? And to him, I'm sorry, because I should have wrote the sentence up here first before I jumped, um, but I'm going to write it up here, and um, hopefully that becomes clearer. Um, is that still a little bit confusing, Brother Lamar? No, that was clear. Okay. So... Noise is what? It's irrelevant information. Though all words have its proper bearing and importance, not all is relevant. Depending on the study, some words bear more weight or have greater importance than others. So we need to be skilled at looking for the keywords, highlighting them, and thinking about all the other words as noise. So, we're going to look into sentence one, and hopefully this makes things a lot more clear. And sentence one says, in Christ, in Christ's parable teaching, The same, oops, the same principle is seen as in his own mission. To the world, the world. Okay. So, what are we're going to highlight two words? We're going to focus on two words, and that is teaching and mission. This is the fourth, and this is the fourteenth word of, in that sentence. Does that make sense? Why I put four and fourteen? Okay. So, where do I want to go from here? Okay. So, Ellen G. White is comparing and contrasting two things, teaching and mission. Parable is connected to teaching. So then, parable becomes important too for us and that is going to connect teaching and mission so in that case if parable is connecting teaching and mission what does parable oops, what does sorry I did it kind of backwards what does parable become in this sentence? The theme. The theme. Good. Mm -hmm. 
So, what does it mean when she says the same? Here. Anyone? Huh? I said only if we It's okay. That para, that teaching para, that teaching. Yes. Mm -hmm. No. Well. No. Sorry. No. That they're the same. Yeah. That teaching is the same as mission. That they're connected. Right. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, that. Yeah. That's what she's saying. Okay. So it means that parables is also connected to mission. Christ is doing parables at two levels. I hope I didn't confuse anyone. So then, all of this, actually, because as is important to us in some essence. This becomes noise. And what's left, it becomes important to us. And that is parable, teaching, oh, my handwriting. Parable, teaching, the same as mission. Isn't that what that says? I'll try not to do that out of habit. What is Christ's mission? So we're focusing on teaching a mission. What is Christ's mission? To save his people. How does he save them? He saves them by comforting them, right? Their pain, comforting their pain. Christ is the comforter. We also know that the Holy Spirit is the comforter, right? How does the Holy Spirit bring us comfort? Amen. What else? Teaches us to be righteous. Amen. prepare us for the judgment. And what is that? Which is the three-step testing process of the everlasting gospel. Amen. So we are given comfort through the gospel, right? Which is grace if we want to say it simply. How does Christ comfort us through the gospel? Amen. He does this through his teachings, words, right? And mission, his life. Teaching and mission. His teaching is a parable and his mission is a parable. Can we all see that? that teaching and mission are connected by parable and that both are basically the same. And we need both. So Matthew 13 verse 34 says, all things, all these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. And without a parable spake he not unto them. He cannot speak to them except in parables. Why? They didn't understand him instead. Amen. They couldn't understand him otherwise. But there's more to that. Let me get there. Okay. He had to meet them where they were, right? And out of mercy, he sought to make complicated subjects simple, right? Because if he would have spoke to them plainly, he could have, right? But he didn't. Why? Because out of mercy, he wanted us to understand him. If he would have spoke, spoke plainly, they would have killed him, and that would have been it. His mission completed, right? But there was more to what he wanted us to learn. And out, of and out of mercy, he took time to teach us in parables.
because he knew that we couldn't understand him otherwise. So to reiterate, Christ's mission is the everlasting gospel. Christ wants us not to live in this world. I don't mean he wants to move he wants us to move planets. For instance, here we are on earth and we think things. What does God want us to think about, earth or heaven? Heaven. 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 Amen. And also, um, this presentation is based off a study, if you haven't realized, if it doesn't sound familiar, um, off a study that Par Elder Parmenter did in France a while back ago, not his recent th um, information but or presentation, but a while back. So, he wants us to be in heavenly places, doesn't he? Even though our bodies are here, he wants us to be heavenly minded. So when you talk to someone, you will not talk to them as if you were on earth, but as if you were in heaven. Who would get irritated in heaven? None of us would. We would be scared to. We would be kind, generous, respectful. If things weren't going well in, in life, how do you think people would respond to those type of situations if they were in heaven? Hmm? How would you respond? Hopefully you would just accept it and be like, well, it is what it is. But do we do that here? Sad to say, we don't all the time. So, we get irritated and we get upset. <laughs> With your mind on heaven, it would change and influence the way you would speak and behave on earth. Mm -hmm. Nothing on this earth would phase you or bother you. Though you're here physically, your mind is not. It is focused on heavenly things. God wants us to think about heavenly places. So, I have not seen and air have not heard what it's like in heaven. So, how can you have thoughts about heaven when you don't even know what it's like? How? We can't. We can't. We have no idea what heaven is like. So, what God needs to do is explain heaven. How will God explain heaven to us? How will he explain something that we've never seen? He's going to try to explain it to you using things that you already understand. So when God wants to teach us about heavenly places, he has to do it through the natural. And what did we learn that is? Parable teaching. Amen. Isn't God so merciful to us? The way that he is going to teach us about the everlasting gospel and how it works, how it operates, by definition, it has to be done through parables. If you want to learn about God, he'll give you a lesson about a wicked judge and this woman who keeps on crying to him. What is he trying to teach us? That we should pray without ceasing. If it works for a wicked king, in contrast, how would it work for a good God? There, is some there are some principles that are seen in his teaching. The principle that is seen in his teaching is parables, the natural and the spiritual. The same principle is seen in his mission or his life. What does that mean? It means that when you look at this man, when you experience him, you see that his words are parables and his life is parables. What does it mean that his life is a parable? Let me explain. Christ came down to earth 2,000 years ago and died for your sins. How do you know that happened? What factual information do you have that that really happened? What evidence do you have? This is in the Bible. Amen. All you have is the Bible. So you have to trust that, right? That there's no good secu 
um, external secular evidence, no picture, no government evidence, no birth certificate, nothing. So you just trust the word. Amen. It's only those people who were living at the time, those eyewitnesses, that it would have made a difference to where he died. But for all the rest of us, it would make not, not it would not make a difference to where he would have died. Now, when Christ is in heaven, what kind of being is he? He's a spiritual being, right? When Christ comes down to earth, what kind of being is he? Amen. Already teaching his parables, isn't he? So you can see in his very life, he is a parable. When he came down to earth, he wasn't a human being like you and me. There, there, were, there were differences. There were some differences. When he came down to earth, he looks like us. He eats like he eats the same food. He has um, the same number of fingers. In fact, if you looked at him, would you even know who he was? He wasn't seven foot, uh, seven foot tall or muscular. He doesn't have a tattoo saying, I'm Jesus. He doesn't have some light glowing out of his head. You, can't, you cannot tell the difference. So what's the difference between him and us? His character. Amen. His heart is new. It's glorious and beautiful. This heart is a spiritual, and his body is the natural. We don't call it the spiritual and the natural. What do we call it? The human and the divine. Humanity and divinity combined, right? So if he wanted to explain to you about salvation, how it works, it's not enough for him to just send a letter. He could have got this book. I don't have it with me, but imagine this is the Bible, right? He could have got this book, how to save book called the Bible, thrown it out of heaven and, and it land on earth and have to have as our instruction. We had the Bible long before Jesus, didn't we? The problem is that teaching is not enough. It's not a complete revelation of how heaven looks. The sin problem is so deeply entrenched. The separation between heaven and earth is so big that sending a book from heaven is not enough. You can't just teach about it. You have to live it. So he's forced to come to earth. He doesn't have a choice. He couldn't die in heaven because we wouldn't have much information to understand how heaven works. So he has to come to earth and not only teach in parables, but he has to be a parable, right? That living parable. Amen. Amen. When it comes to us, if I were to say you're a hypocrite, what would I be saying? Anyone? You say one thing, but you do another. You don't practice what you preach, right? Your teaching is not in agreement with your life. This is what hypocrisy is, isn't it? For, for us to be holistic, complete, we need to sort out two, we need to sort two things out. The teaching and the life. It's not enough to just tell people what to do. You have to show them how it's done. This is, the, this is why Christ was a parable in his words and his life. So I want us to stop being hypocrites. Stop telling people to be good when you're bad. Is this what, is this, what this is showing? Not really. This is not a rebuke to tell you to stop teaching. I'm not saying to stop telling me to be good when you're not good. What I want us to understand is that the very nature of the human being, if we desire to be in heavenly places, needs to follow the model that Christ had, which was the combination of humanity and divinity, which by definition is a parable. So just as Christ is a parable, we need to be a parable. We are a parable. 
When you see his body, his tone of voice, his facial expressions, how he uses his muscles with his hands, what his hands are for, these are all parables that explain what's on the inside, the spiritual. They explain what heaven is like. If you want to know what heaven is going to be like, look in the mirror. And if you see, and if what you see you don't like, you know there's a problem. This is what it means when his life is a parable. Okay. I think. Amen. Um, how much time do I have? Um, I'm actually going to stop here. Um, and close. But does everybody have a good grasp on what parable teaching is? Yes. Okay. Does this definition make sense? Oh, okay. I just pray that um, we all become that parable that Christ is wanting us to be, right? That living parable. Let's kneel for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you so humbly, thankful for your mercy towards us, and that you came here to be that living parable as a pattern for us to follow, to give us the opportunity to die to self and to be a new person in Christ Jesus, to be that living example, that living epistle, that living parable so that others may also come to know you and experience you. Please, Lord, help us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.